Good morning, Water's Edge. I hate to break up the fellowship, but we're going to uh, start to fellowship, worship together by paying attention. <laughs> class, up here, class. Well, good morning, everyone. We have come together to worship the one true God. His name is Jesus Christ, Father, Son, Holy Spirit in one it is a mystery it is a wonderful mystery and we love and praise him this morning um we are gonna pray in just a second but um i know some of you are new um and so for, for those of you who are new i'm uh, pastor mike i'm one of the elders here so good morning uh we are so thankful to have y'all gathered together this morning and worship with us it is a gorgeous day is it not this is the day that the lord has made we will rejoice and be glad in it amen Amen. So uh, another thing, let me direct your attention to. We have a couple of chests over here. Um, if the Lord leads you to give this morning, um, the first chest that's closest to me is our Wham 21 chest. That is to help us build out this facility over here, so we have more room inside too. Um, it is a wonderful and glorious process, and God is just using this. There's, I have got a couple of people telling me to turn it up. Okay, God is just using this. I gotta put my teacher voice on, huh? Okay, I can do that. God is using this process to glorify Himself, and we want to see Him finish this process so we can continue to build His kingdom in other ways, uh, other ministries, and do some community events in there and just draw everybody in to hear about the good news. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, and the second chest is just regular tithes and offerings. However, the Lord leads you to give, be free in that. Uh, but let's pray this morning. Uh, so excited to be here together in worship, and this is the, should be the best part of our week to get together and praise Him. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you so much. Your goodness and loving kindness is boldly placed before us in Your creation. We have no excuse this morning not to worship You, this Lord. Uh, the sun is shining, the grass is green. Springtime just reminds us of renewal and revival and rebirth. And Lord, that's got to lead us. So thinking about your resurrection, we just celebrated Easter. It helps us think about being born again in your spirit, um, not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Lord, those are amazing things. They're a mystery to us, and yet you put them out there for us to, to know you, um, to have our relationship healed with you, um, to walk away from sin and turn towards you, uh, the good, good Father that loves us perfectly. So we praise you this morning, Lord. We pray that you will glorify yourself this morning. May your kingdom be built this morning. Uh, may you change our hearts, turn us towards Christ. Uh, let us live and walk more like him every day because he is worthy of all of our praise, worthy of all of our worship, all of our lives, everything that we can do. You are worthy, Lord. And we praise you this morning. Uh, lead our hearts now. Change our minds. Whatever you want to do, Father, we give you all of it. Help us surrender to you, Lord. Um, Father, if there's someone here that doesn't know you this morning, I pray that you will lift the veil from their eyes so that they can see clearly the goodness of God and his love for them. We love you this morning, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mike. Uh, Justin has some song sheets for you if you need one. There's also a post on, on our Facebook page with in the comments with the lyrics as well as... An email that went out, if you're part of our email chain, then you got an email early this morning with the lyrics in it. So, uh, but Justin has about 25 copies of the song sheets, so if you'd like one of those physical song sheets, he's passing those around right now. I wanted to read for us this morning part of Psalm 99, as we think about the holiness of God and the awesomeness of God and the strength of God and the goodness of God this morning, as we acknowledge his holiness, listen to what Psalm 99 says. The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earthquake 
The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his, mighty, in, in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. footstool. Holy is he. So let's stand and let's sing together this morning. Holy, holy, holy. And you will notice as you look at the song lyrics, you do only have three of those verses. There is a fourth verse that we will sing this morning. Um, but I think you'll be able to pick up on it if it's one that you're familiar with. So. these kind of four key words as we go through these songs this morning related to who God is and what he's like. Holy, awesome, uh, strong, and good. And this is something that, that we know through God's work in our lives, through his spirit's work in our lives. And this is something we know through studying God's word that God is holy, awesome, strong, and good. And this is something that the first century Christians would have known as well. And their knowledge of that gave them a confidence to move out exactly in the way that God called them to move out, exactly the way that Jesus commanded them to move out, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. They had the confidence to do that because they knew the holiness, the awesomeness, the strength, and the goodness of God. 
Listen to the way Jeremiah describes this in Jeremiah chapter 10. Starting at verse 6, he says, There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O king of the nations? For this is your due. For among all the wise ones of the nations, and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. This gave the early Christians great confidence in the midst of great persecution to step out in faith, in obedience, for their holy, awesome, strong, and good God. So let's sing about that awesomeness of God this morning. And I'll warn you, this one gets a little high. That's okay. Sing higher. Sing louder. Right? Let's blast it out this morning. Let's see. Um, awesome is the Lord most high. Raise your hands, all you nations. Shout to God, all creation. How awesome is the Lord most high. Great are you, Lord, mighty and strength. You are faithful, you will ever be. We will praise you all of our days. It's for your glory we offer everything. Raise your hands, our nation shall
Lift your voice and cry out, awesome is our strong God, mighty is our God. Sing out, lift your hands and shout out, awesome is our strong God, mighty is our God. To the fatherless, tender of freedom for the prisoner. This is God in His holy place.
Teach us, illuminate the word to us, help us to apply it to our lives. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all can be seated. Pastor Ben. I love that last song, singing about the goodness of God and how the goodness of God is chasing after us and we want to be chasing after Him and by His Spirit He draws us to want to chase after Him. That's all God's work in our life when He does that, bringing salvation to us and giving us a desire to run after God, to seek after God, to want to be in God's favor and have God's favor upon us and that's all possible through the work of, the work of Christ that we have enjoyed uh, seeing over the past uh, few weeks as we walk through the book of Acts, uh, seeing the resurrected Christ, fulfill His promises, and sending back the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's now with the early church as we walk through Acts, and we get to begin to see uh, all these promises come true. But as we were singing the song about the goodness of God, and how we are to make great of the goodness of God, I was thinking about what we're going to see in the story book of God this morning out of Acts chapter 3. And if you want to follow along with me, uh, I'm going to actually be walking through the story, reading through the story, and and then uh, speaking about some insights from it at the end of the story. But I'll be in Acts chapter 3 this morning, and it's good to have everybody here. God's given us a beautiful day. So I'm going to pray again and ask God to bless our time in the Word. And uh, as we walk through the Word today, we're going to see some great things about our Lord and Savior in the Word. But also be looking for a wow. There's kind of a wow factor, uh, then there's a word factor. But know this, that when I say there's a, a wow factor, that's not separate from the word factor, because the word factor is always a wow. <laughs> it, it's always an eternal wow. But you're going to see also just kind of a... a a wow factor takes place with the early church, with Peter and John and the early disciples. Remember, the setting is Jesus has gone back to be with God the Father. And he said, now go out and be my witnesses. In essence, go out and, like we're just saying, and speak about the goodness of God. Go out and make great of God. Go out and tell people about this good news of Christ. I say salvation has come to the world. And, and proclaim it among your own people and wherever I send you. And so that's the context. And so now they're just going to begin to live their lives out for Christ and see what that looks like. And we're going to see uh, really incredible cool story with a wow factor and a word factor this morning and so I want to pray that God helps us see it clearly this morning as well in our day and time and apply it for us here in Lake Country in 2021. Sound good? All right let's pray. Heavenly Father thank you so much for the chance to be together in, in, a, in an awesome beautiful day and you've just been so gracious to us uh, this season the past few Sundays it's just beautiful to be outdoors in your creative order and to enjoy you as our great creator God as well as enjoy you as our great savior God. You have saved us through Christ. You've sent Jesus to be our, our Savior and our Redeemer, and He's the King and Shepherd of this church. And so, Lord Jesus, we know You're watching over us to the glory of God the Father. And You've not left us alone to worship and, and figure out how to worship. You, you've sent back Your Holy Spirit to be with us, to, to dwell with us, and to be in those who place, place their faith in Christ. And so, Lord, I'm, I'm praying that by Your Spirit, over the Lordship of Christ, the glory of God the Father, You'll bless our time in the Word this morning, and uh, You'll receive all the glory, work in our hearts, what You want us to see and how You want us to apply it transform us more into the image of Jesus as we worship this morning and we'll give you the praise because you're a good good God and we ask these things in your name in the name of Jesus amen and amen <clears throat> well as I mentioned we got an incredible story now in the in the book of Acts chapter 3 and I, my, my, my youngest daughter Joelle asked me this morning uh, I hope she didn't mind me sharing this she had she had two shoe options uh, had a, a black pair of uh, some kind of boot options and she had a high her high top sneakers, her Converse sneakers, and she asked me which pair to wear. And you know, you know what I probably said. You know, go with the happy shoes, right? Go with the, go with the high tops. And uh, I thought, you know, I already had my boots on. I thought I should wear my high tops today because when I'm, I have my high tops on, it's like my happy shoes. And this is a happy story. But if I had my high tops on, I might be jumping around on the stage. And you'll see what I mean by that in a moment when you see what takes place. By the way, in the temple of God. Now remember, the church is in a transitional season right now. Peter and John and the whole temple worship and so forth and how they can now, by the Spirit of God, worship anywhere in the world Jesus. And, 
and, and how they're free in Christ, but they're still going to the temple, uh, still working out some of their traditions that God had brought to the people of Israel. Um, but you're going to see inside this story, it's going to want to make you jump up and shout and uh, kind of run around because that's what happens uh, inside the temple, and it's disturbed some people, just so you know. <laughs> it usually happens today, too, by the way. If you go to a typical service somewhere and you see someone jumping around too much, you get a little bit nervous, right? I think there should be controlled jumping around, mind you, right? I need to be controlled and somewhat needs to be purposeful. But you're going to see when Jesus begins to work in somebody's life, man, it, it, bring, it brings a joy. It brings an excitement. It brings a, like, you know, you want to do, do one of those numbers, right? I mean, it just, it just gets, it gets, uh, it gets a hold of you. Now, sometimes it is emotional. It's okay to have emotions. God created us with emotions, right? That's, that's his gift to us, okay? And so you're going to see some emotions uh, brought out in a physical way inside this story. So I walk, walk through the story. <clears throat> Watch for the wow factor and the word factor, and then we'll come back and unpack that just a little bit, those two things. And so I'm in Acts chapter 3. And i got to put my clip here so it doesn't blow away. Acts chapter 3, here we go. So it says in verse 1, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. Remember we saw last week how the disciples, they continued to pray, right? They continued to fellowship and gather and to pray. And so as part of their custom, they would go to the temple there in Israel, in Jerusalem, and they would pray. And it says they were going to the temple, and the hour of the prayer was the ninth hour. That's 3 o'clock in the afternoon in their context. And so as they're going to the temple, Peter and John, probably some other disciples with them, it says a, a man lame from birth. Now that's important. The guy has not never walked, all right, mind you. He's lame from birth. He's not able to walk, not able to, uh, to maneuver around and probably provide for himself and all the things that go along with that in their cultural context. And so he's basically a beggar at the temple. It says a lame man from birth was being carried there. Why is he carried? Because he can't walk, right? So you get the picture of someone who's very needy. He can't walk. He's going to the temple, and you're going to see why he's there. He's carried to the temple, and they laid, them, laid him down at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. And so the whole picture here is is a, a man who's lame from birth, who has never walked, who gets carried to the temple every day, set at a certain gate where people would walk by. It's like if we if we had uh, uh, someone sitting here, right here by the cars, and on Sunday mornings, uh, we know you park here and you walk this way, and so maybe have someone sitting there, and every morning he's there, Sunday after Sunday, or worship time after worship time, to ask for alms, ask for money, ask for provisions somehow to provide for himself. That's the picture of a very needy person there at the temple. And so Peter and John, they're simply walking to the gate to go into worship and pray, as was their custom. All right? And so I don't think this man probably expected anything different this day than any other day that he had been there to ask for money and alms to provide for himself. But he's there at the temple. And it tells us in verse 3, Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive what? Alms. Money, in essence. He did what he's always done his whole life. His probably parents put him there. He's, he's just going to ask for money. He sees John and Peter. And check this out in verse 4. And Peter then directed his gaze at him, as did John. Peter, Peter and John, they, they see this man. And for some reason, you see, you see something begin to unfold in the story. A little bit extraordinary, it seems like, in the moment. But Peter just begins to see that person. And he begins to fix his eyes on that person. And, and he's gazing upon him. And then Peter says these words. Really kind of bold if you think about it. He says, hey. He may not have said, hey. It's just my interpretation. But he says this. Look at us. Look at us. Calling himself and, and, and John. And the man fixes attention on them. Expecting what? Expecting something spiritual or something supernatural? No. Just like any other morning he would be there to ask for alms. Expecting to receive something from them, yes. Probably money or food or provisions or maybe a lead as to how to get more provisions. Well, we can't take care of you today. I don't have anything, but check with uh, you know Jimmy down the street on Monday. We'll try to help you out. And so he's just expecting what he's always expected, right? But he fixes his eyes uh, back towards them. And then Peter says this, a well-known a well -known, uh, phrase in Scripture. Peter said, listen... I have no silver and gold. You're asking for money. I have no silver and gold. But what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. I mean, think about the setting and the context, right? I, this, this layman has been at the temple all of his life asking for alms, asking for money. 
And now Peter and John are there, and they say, hey, hey, look at us. And let's catch eyes and, and focus in on me right now. Listen, I don't have any gold and silver, right? But what I do have to offer you, I'm going to offer you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And then he says, rise up and walk. I mean, I don't know what the lame man may have been thinking. But when he said, rise up and walk in the name of Jesus, specifically Jesus of Nazareth, which would make the connection as to the, you mean the one that was what crucified here in Jerusalem about two months ago, when, when all the drama and the uproar about crucify him, crucify him, that, that Jesus, you're going to ask me to get up and walk in, in his name? I, I, just, I just need some money. And, and so I think it's kind of a bizarre statement to come from Peter and John in that context. And probably that may have been going through the mind of the, the lame person, I don't know, but, but just like, why, why would you say that? What, I've not walked my entire life, and now you're not going to provide for my needs, but you're going to tell me to, to rise and, and walk in the name of Jesus. And I think he was crucified, and maybe maybe the lame men had heard some rumors or stories because Jesus obviously did not appear to everyone after his resurrection. But I'm sure the, the news was getting out about, hey, this one named Jesus was crucified. His disciples are gathering. They're saying he's, he's risen. He's, he's no longer in the tomb. And, and, and Yeah, but all the priests and the religious leaders of the temple are saying, no way, right? They're rejecting the message of uh, the cross and the, the death, burial, and resurrection and what it means and that Christ is risen. And so they've been rejecting that. He's at the temple. I'm sure he's probably more in tune with what the, the priests are saying at the temple than what the disciples have been saying about the resurrection of Christ. But here is a challenge, right? It's like a game on. It's either, hey, for the disciples, something's either going to happen or these guys are fools. Are you with me? If you say something like that to a lame person who's been there all their life, they're either going to be seen as fools and it's going to be in the story of the disciples. We wouldn't be here this morning or something mighty in the faith is going to happen because the disciples of Christ say, listen, I don't have silver or gold, but what I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth and you're going to rise up and walk if you listen. So it's quite a remarkable statement by Peter to this man. But not only did he say the words, then he offered his hand. He says, he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And then immediately his feet and his ankles were strong. And so you picture someone who's, I can't even imagine, someone who's never walked their entire life, right? And, and there's just no strength in the legs. And then they stand up and they're strong. And he's standing there, right? As Peter lifts him up. And it says, and then leaping up. He stood and began to walk and enter the temple with them. And so I, I, this seems, that seems pretty like a, a natural flow of the story, right? The, I've never walked my entire life. These men say, hey, stand up and walk, and they help lift me up. And then, you know who I'm following? I'm following Peter and John. Hey, where are you guys going? What's going on here? This is crazy, right? I'm going to hang with them. And so he begins to walk with them. It's almost like, it's like, almost like a natural flow of the story, but a miracle's already taken place. He's walking with them into the temple. Are you with me on that? That's why I said it's a, crazy, it's a crazy, joyful story. He's walking with them as they go into the temple, right? Well, why is the reason that he's walking uh, in there with them? Well, before I get there, i got to share two other words here. It says walking and leaping and praising who? You, know, you may not have your scripture before you, but praising God. That's in verse 8. I mean, so he's not... I assume he probably started out walking, right? But then, you know, he's like, okay, this is this is crazy. Like, man, I can't believe this, right? And then all of a, all of a sudden, he's like, hey, this is, this is awesome, right? And then it's like, woo! You know, he just, he's on cloud nine. He doesn't care. Well, I'm going to the temple. I better I better be, you know, go get a suit and tie and get reserved. No, he's just, he's wide open, right? And he's praising God. He can't help himself. That's what's happened, right? And so this is kind of, by the way, this is the wow factor. It's like, wow! Like, oh my gosh, this is nuts. And he knows it's crazy. It's just off the charts, right? There's nothing to explain it from a human perspective, right? He knows it's got to be supernatural. It's got to be coming from above, not from below. Man can't do this. Uh, if he could, he would have done it years and years ago. And he can't do this. And so he's not only walking, but leaping, and he's praising God. Something radically has changed in his life. He knows it physically. But you're going to see in a moment, it's more than just a wow factor from a human perspective and a, and, and a physical uh, miracle. It's, it's much more important than that, actually, as the word factor comes in. But he's going in, and he's walking, and he's leaping, and he's praising God. Now check this out. If you've been with us the past few Sundays, you're going to see this correlation all, all the time through the book of Acts. It's like, okay, God's doing a miracle. We see that, right? If God's doing a miracle, he's going to have a purpose for the miracle. Am I, am I right on that? And we've been seeing that. Just like when the Holy Spirit came, and you got this roar. But it's not windy. But the roar is like the wind. And so it gathered everybody's attention. And so everyone wanted to come and see what's that roar and that sound. And... 
So you're going to see a similar unfolding here. A miracle is taking place. A wow has happened there at the temple. And so it's not just to this individual that's now walking that's the focal point. But listen what happens here. In verse 9, And all the people saw him walking and praising God. So people begin to see and observe what's taking place. And they recognize him. Wait a minute. That's, that's the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. I've seen that guy. Maybe I'll give him some money over the years, but that, that guy's been there his entire life. It's, it's him. Like, what in the world's going on? So the wow factor begins with the lame man, and now the wow factor is spreading out to all the people gathered there at the temple. I think God's got something going down here. I could be wrong. I have to wait and see here. But, but the people are beginning to see what's taking place. And it says this, And they were filled with what? With wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. That's just natural, right? They were naturally just like, wow, that is, that is pretty cool. I don't, I don't know what's going on. And I, I, maybe I've heard now the name Jesus mentioned, and I, I don't believe in all that, but it's kind of neat that guy's walking and he's leaping, and wait, that, he's praising God. That's kind of cool. That, that is the same guy. I'm pretty sure, right? I, can, I recognize him. as the same guy who's been here all his life. And, and so the people are like, man, what in the world is going on? It's a good day to be in the temple, right? It's a good day to be here. Like, this is incredible. And they're seeing it, and they're in awe. So God's had a miracle unfold. And the miracle has unfolded, but I think it doesn't end there. When the miracle unfolds, I, I believe there's going to be a message with the miracle. And you can stay with me, right? And I, I, we'll have to wait and see, but I'm just going to, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to assume when there's a miracle, there's going to be a message. And I got a feeling the message is going to point to whom? The Messiah. And the Messiah's name, church, is Jesus. See if I'm wrong. See if I'm wrong. Let's see. Verse 11, the story continues. While he clung to Peter and John. <laughs> I can see why. All the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. It's like Solomon's porch. Uh, can't wait when we get the warehouse done. We've got a, a big like, porch-like structure on this side of the warehouse indoors, and we may even call it Solomon's porch, a place to gather underneath the porch. And so they're, they're gathered there at the Solomon's porch, and, and people ha are astounded. So they're coming together. You know what's happening here? Peter's getting an, getting an audience now to tell them about someone. The message is coming, right? And so they're, they're gathered there. What's going on? In verse 12, and when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. So here we go. Just like we've seen already in the book of Acts, we've got the, the wow factor, the miracle, right? But now uh, people are gathered together, and, and now Peter says, you know what? Wow, okay, cool. I got a, I got a gather audience. I wonder what Peter's going to speak about. The message is coming. Here's the message of Peter. We won't be able to break it down in detail this morning. But listen up. It's the message of Peter. He's going to draw from Old Testament Scripture, the things that God has already revealed about the coming of the Messiah. These things are prophesied. These things have taken place. And, and this is what you did, and this is what you should do now. Listen to it as you walk through the, the message of, of Peter. It says, While he clung to Peter and John, the people gathered there at the porch. Peter saw the crowd, and he begins to say these words. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why, why do you even stare at us? Speaking of Peter and John, why, why do you stare at us as though by our own power, our own piety, that we have made him walk? You, you catch what Peter's doing right here from the get-go? He's turning the attention to himself away from himself right to, to someone else. It's important in the church. Let me just make a side note. I, I watched a, a couple of sermons last night uh, about the contemporary church today, talking about church and our culture. And sometimes, and, and man, I want to be humble and just keep an eye on ourselves as well uh, and uh, hold ourselves accountable as well. But, but sometimes in, in church life across America, across the nations, uh, it comes and expressed in various theological patterns. Uh, but sometimes uh, there can be a lot of tension to, to uh, a pastor uh, or to certain people or certain aspects of the church. And it's in the name of Jesus, but it's not genuinely, truly focused on Jesus himself. We gather in the name of Jesus for a reason. And Peter's got an incredible audience right here. Right? And he, he, could, he could twist that story the way he wants to to himself if he wanted to. But right from the get-go, he says, listen, you guys are drawn in. And you're, you're in all fact, you're in all mi mindset right now. You've seen a wow thing, right? I just want you guys to know right up front, 
This has nothing to do with uh, my, my own personal power some way or, or my own piety, like somehow I can do something that's holy and from above and supernatural. No, this is not about me, but hang on with me because it's about someone I want you to hear. And so Peter deflects the attention away from himself with these words. Why do you look at us as if I had some kind of power of piety? Then he says this. goes back to their beginning. The God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, uh, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. That's going back to the, the cross of it and how they, they wanted Christ crucified and, and uh, Barabbas was set free. And so he's reminding them what took place you know, a couple months ago. He says, you, you wanted to crucify this Holy and Righteous One and it was God's servant and his name is Jesus and yet you handed him over to Pilate and he was crucified. He goes on to say, and asked for a murder to be granted to you and you killed the author of life. And so, you know, in my Bible, sometimes I'll draw a cross if I see the, the cross being spotlighted, and that's what Peter's doing. Peter takes him to the cross. He says, you, you killed the author of life. That's the, that's the cross. It took place at Calvary, right? But then with the cross also comes the message of the what? The resurrection. And Peter goes on to say, whom God raised from the dead. And, and so we won't do this, but if we wanted to do this, we kind of need to exercise. On Easter Sunday, we talked about Ten repetitions of the resurrection of Christ. I got a feeling we wanted to. We can see, oh, there's number 11. Oh, there's number 12. There's number 18. There's number 20. We walk through the book of Acts. We're going to see the repetition of the resurrection come up over and over and over and over and over and over again. Why is that? Because the grave's empty. And the world needs to hear. And so Peter's taken him to the cross. And right in the cross message, yes, you killed Jesus. But guess what? He is risen. You have the cross and the resurrection. In the message of Peter, he goes on. He says, To this we are witnesses. And his name, by the faith in his name, speaking the name of Jesus, and Jesus' name, by faith in Jesus' name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of everyone. In the presence of you all. And so what Peter does, he spotlights Christ, right? And then he goes on. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that as Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. What's been said way back when about how the Messiah, the righteous one, would be, would be crucified and suffer for the salvation of man to be the ultimate sacrifice for man's sin, what God said then, it's happened through Christ. It's been fulfilled in Jesus. So what should be the response? I believe Peter probably said more on this day, but this is kind of the, 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 uh, the, the uh, cliff note version that Luke gives us. And now he goes to response. The response is this in verse, verse 19. Repent, therefore, and turn back. The response to Christ is always the same. We should repent of sins. It, it, I'm in Christ. When I sin, I should do what? The response should be the same. I repent of my sins and want to walk in the holiness of Christ. So repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. That's the whole gospel message, that we are, we are captive to sin, and through Christ's faith in Him, our sins are washed away. We've been speaking about that often the past few weeks. That your sins may be blotted out, the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive into the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. So he's saying, listen, you need to trust in Jesus. Jesus is coming back. All the things prophesied are going to happen. Trust in him. will come back to receive the church unto himself. And so you need to believe in Christ. And then he begins to speak about a couple examples from Old Testament to prophets. He quotes Moses. Moses said this. Quote, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. And you shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. That's kind of a serious word there. It's a serious word of judgment. 
The, the reality is judgment for those who reject Christ. It's a reality of eternal hell, eternal separation from God, eternal damnation. And so the reason we want the message of the gospel to go out because Jesus desires that none should perish, but that all come to him. And so his message is free and open. It's, a, it's, a, it's inclusive, but it is exclusive from the fact that it's only through Christ. And so we proclaim the message. As Peter did, gathered there in Jerusalem, the play, same place where they had crucified his Savior some two months earlier. So Moses said that someone's coming, and you must place your faith in him. He goes on to say this, And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaim these days. All, if you study the Old Testament scriptures, you'll begin to see as you grow in your faith. Probably not initially, but over time, you can begin to see uh, reflections of Christ in the Old Testament scriptures, how the Old Testament scriptures are, are there, and they're pointing to the coming of the Messiah. They're pointing to the coming of the righteous and the Holy One and the author of life. And so Peter's trying to help them understand that. Peter had a little bit of uh, teaching, by the way. Jesus pulled him aside, uh, right? I think before he went to back to be the Father and began to teach him, unfold him like on the road to Emmaus and things that were speaking about him in the Old Testament Scriptures. And now Peter's passing that on. And so these things were prophesied by all the, all the prophets pointing to this, this Messiah. He concludes by this. He says, You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. All the nations would be blessed through Israel because God would bring the Savior through the people of Israel. God having raised up his servant, there's the resurrection again. God having raised up his servant, sending him, and then, and then death, burial, and resurrection, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one uh, of you from your wickedness. So it's interesting there, even in the close of the, the message, he's saying that it is a blessing to turn from wickedness, and I believe that's still true today. If we turn from sin, it's a blessing that God has for us. So how does this story end? We won't be able to see it all this morning. We'll see some next week, what happens to Peter and John. But here's how the story ends according to Peter. I mean, according to Luke. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees, these are all religious leaders, they came upon them. Hey, what's going on here? You know, do you have authority to be teaching and drawing this great crowd, right? And so what's going on here? It says they're greatly annoyed. Why? They're greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening time. We're not going to deal with you tonight. We're going to arrest you guys, put you in prison, and we'll deal with you tomorrow. And then Luke records this closing part that will end here. He says, But many of those who had heard the word believed... And the number of the men came to be about 5,000. If you recall, after the, Peter's message at uh, the festival like Lake Fest called Pentecost for them, uh, at that festival, it tells us that some 3,000 men accepted Christ, put their faith in Jesus. And now he's seeing the numbers up to about 5,000. Just focus on the men. Uh, men would have influence on their family. There's probably more that are believing in Christ as well. But they mentioned the men. So there's now 5,000 men. Maybe 2,000 men came to, uh, to Christ that day in Jerusalem. Uh, he's tying back to their heritage and their story about God and how now the story about God and what is revealed, how salvation would come, has been fulfilled in Christ. And the people believed. The men believed. And so inside this story, I hope you saw some uh, two things here. There, there's a wow factor in the miracle, right? Uh, and then there's a word factor that has a miracle as well take place in regards to the salvation of the people. And so I want to go back and just, just kind of highlight just uh, a few insights about the word and, and then uh, one insight really about the, the wow factor of the miracle, all right? So I, wanna, I just want to highlight, uh, in regards to the message itself, we're not going to unpack it in detail like we typically do, but what I notice inside this message from Peter is, is that Peter exalts Jesus a, a number of times. The, the glory of Christ, the focus of Jesus, is exalted in various ways. And I just want to give you some highlights that we just read through to kind of spotlight those in regards to Peter. If we're to be like the disciples in the early church, if we're to be a church like the church was then, then we'll probably preach and teach and do something very similar as they were doing. So what did Peter spotlight? And you, you already know the answer there, but let me show you how, show you how he spotlights Christ. So the first example is um, that Jesus is referred to as a servant of God, a servant of the Lord. That's in verse 13 that we read. 
If you go back to uh, the Old Testament Scriptures, in Isaiah 53, 13, it says this, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently, and he shall be exalted, and he shall be extolled. Uh, very high. It means he'll be praised uh, enthusiastically. He'll be lifted up. My servant will be. Well, that Old Testament prophecy is pointing to Jesus uh, as the, the suffering servant, right? And Jesus, when he came here, he said that I did not come to what be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And so Jesus was the great servant. And it tells us in the Old Testament scriptures, God says, my servant that I sin, he's going to be lifted up high. He's going to be extolled and worshipped and honored like no one else. And that's exactly what's taking place here by Peter at the temple in Jerusalem. Christ is being lifted up. Jesus is a servant. It also says in verse 13 that we read that God glorified this Jesus. That God glorified this Jesus. Um, in Peter's sermon, he wanted us to see that Christ is glorified. We know before Jesus went back to be with God the Father, he prayed that he'd be able to go back to be with the Father and that he'd be able to sit back in his glory with the Father as he had from the very beginning. And that's what's taking place here. Jesus Christ, we saw at the sermon uh, at that festival called Pentecost, that Peter says he's now sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Jesus, in all of his uh, majesty and his glory and his power and his authority, he reigns right now at the right hand of God the Father. Why? Because he's glorified, because he's one of glory with the Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, and I and the Father are one. Jesus reigns. And Peter's making that clear when he says, listen, Jesus is glorified Jesus, which means who has glory except God alone, right? And so he's glorified. He's a great servant. He's also glorified. And then Peter goes on to say, listen, you, you all killed. He's very, very serious. You killed. He says he killed who? You killed the holy and righteous one. It's like two titles given to Jesus. Some people may be thinking, well, he was just a man, right? No, he was, he was a God man. He was, he was holy and he was righteous. I, I thought uh, the Old Testament scripture says that there's no one who's holy. There's no, no one who's righteous. No, not one. Oh, there is a righteous one, there is a holy one, and his name is Jesus. Jesus was the holy uh, sacrifice, the sinless Lamb of God, right? He is the worthy one. He's the only one who could be the, the ultimate sacrifice to, to end the, the sacrificial system of, of Judaism, if you will, and, and the people of Israel, that his blood would be sufficient, like the bulls and goats' blood was not, his blood would be sufficient to end the sacrifice, because in him, his righteousness it is worthy unto God, our holy God, to become the wrath bearer for us. That through Christ, then, our sins are forgiven. His blood was sufficient, and He is the one who is the Holy One and righteous. And through faith in Him, you know what we receive? We receive the holiness and righteousness of Christ. We're not holy and righteous in ourselves, but through faith in Christ, we, we, uh, what's imputed to us is the righteousness and the holiness of God. So when God the Father looks at us, He might say, well, Bo, you're not walking in my kingdom. You're not an heir of me because of your sin. You can't be in my presence. No, he looks at me as having my faith in Christ. So he sees me through Jesus and says, okay, because of Jesus, yes, you are righteous and holy. You can be in my presence because I'm receiving you through Christ. There's the means of our salvation. So what we see here, though, is that Peter spotlights Jesus as the servant. Jesus is being glorified. He spotlights Jesus as the holy and righteous one. And then he gives him another title here. He says, listen, you killed the author of life. Jesus is the, the author of life. What, what a title, right? And uh, we could spend a lot of time unpacking that. But in essence, Jesus is the co-creator with God the Father. You can look at Colossians chapter 1 and see that. Not only is he co-creator with God the Father, it says that Jesus sustains all things in the universe. He is the sustainer. He has all power and glory and might and authority with God the Father. See the right hand of the, of the Father. And so he is the author of life. Those are... Those are the, the, the people in Peter's day would be thinking, wait a minute, there's only one who's the author of life, in the beginning God, right, in the scriptures. Well, what Peter's saying, in the beginning God, yes, God, Father, Son, and Spirit, and Jesus is the author of life with God the Father. Like, whoa, that's either, that's either blasphemy, that you all deserve to be uh, persecuted and hung just like, just like you're Jesus, or there's going to be power in the message because the message is true. And I'm, I'm arguing this morning, the message is true, that's why we're here this morning. It's true. He's the author of life. <laughs> and then one last one he's also the resurrected king and that's what affirms it all we see in these verses of Peter in this sermon that he says listen God raised him up what does that mean that the father endorsed Jesus by raising him up from the dead 
by the power of the Spirit. So it means that Jesus Christ is exactly who he says he is, that he is the, he's the risen Lord, that he's King Jesus, he's resurrected Jesus, he's no longer in the tomb. And so as I just took a, a brief walk back through the sermon, what I wanted us to see is that Peter, as he's preaching about Christ, he, he's, spotlighting, he's spotlighting Jesus. He's spotlighting Jesus as servant, uh, as a glorified uh, servant, um, as risen servant, um, uh, as one who is the author of life, as one who is uh, the uh, holy and righteous one. And so over and over and over and over again in various ways, what Peter's doing, he says, listen, listen, people are gathered. Jesus is the answer. He is the hope. He is the one to be magnified as our great Lord and Savior and King to the glory of God the Father. That's all He does. Why are we gathered here this morning? Do the same thing Peter was doing some 2,000 years ago to magnify Jesus. That's what we do when we gather. We, we magnify Jesus. The songs you're singing, if you're singing from a heart that loves the Lord, you're seeking to magnify Jesus to the glory of God the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to worship God. And so we magnify Jesus. Our, our mission statement as a church is to make great of God in Christ Jesus by His Spirit to all in the heart of Lake Country and beyond for His glory and our joy in Him. We are here simply to magnify Christ, to make great the message of Christ, the glory of God the Father. How do we do that? By the powering the presence of the Spirit. Just like Peter is filled by the Spirit, he's been given power then to go out and make the message known so that everyone would hear about the good news of Christ, that you can have salvation in Him. No longer addicted and chained to sin, but free in Christ to live for the glory of God. So Peter was magnifying Jesus. We gather to do the same thing, to magnify, to magnify Christ. If we ever stray from that as a church, man, I pray God makes it very clear that God convicts of sin, that God draws us to our knees and humbles us in some way. We, we are about unashamedly the person and work of Jesus. And the application for us today, then, as we as God's people go out and live our lives in Lake Country and wherever God sends us, we are to be about Christ. And to be about Christ, it does look a certain way. It does have a certain a flow of a rhythm of life, of things that we don't know. Well, what, what is Christ like? And so we're in His Word to understand what it means to be a follower of Christ. And then over time, our lives become more like Jesus, where people can see prayerfully Jesus in, in us. And just so you know, I don't mean to disappoint you this morning. Uh, it may not be the right word, but it's going to be a little bit peculiar to the to the world. If you try to if you try to take Christ's likeness and, and then somehow blend it in really smoothly with the world, then you're not going to be reflecting Christ very very well. Um, we want to have friendships and we want to be in the world. We want to love our community well here in Lake Country. But just so you know, if you're really passionate about Jesus, you're going to stand out just a little bit. You're going to be a little bit peculiar in some ways. And, and, and so you've got to discern, is your, is your love more to be accepted in the culture of the world, or is your love more uh, desiring to be accepted by Christ and to live for His glory? We as a church have to make that decision. It's on us. I want to, I want to contend that we should live for the glory of Christ and, and enjoy Him forever. What was the Westminster Confession? Somebody put it on a on a text today. Where's the? Uh, uh, where are you out there? Westminster Confession at the conference. Yeah, over there. Jason. Sorry, I couldn't think of the name of the Jason put out there uh, uh, some text this week, and Westminster Confession says this. Uh, I think from the 1600s it says, um, "The chief end of man is to glorify glorify God and enjoy Him forever." Something almost. I'm kind of paraphrasing, but a great great statement. The chief end of man. This is like from the 1600s that. Uh, people got together and said, hey, let's write the things that we see about God in, in the Scriptures. It says, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So so the joy, by the way, it doesn't have to be like said, oh, like a stick in the mud. You can, you can be like that guy. <laughs> you can be like the guy in the temple and get a little excited sometimes, okay? It doesn't mean that it has to be like just like, oh, I want to walk with God now, enjoy God. And it, it's, there can be joy, right? I mean, you should you should... I think I was in tune with Jesus yesterday, as best I know how, uh, and, and loving Him, enjoying Him. And I was in an old beat-up Jeep driving down these mud puddles and these hills and so forth, going crazy, right? And I thought, man, thank you, Jesus. This life is good, right? There's all kind of joy going on. It can, it can be expressed in different ways. Thank you, Harmon. Um, it can be expressed in different ways. Um, and this time the Jeep made it back to the, to the, to the base camp, which is great. Woo! Um, but you can have fun enjoying Christ. But Christ is everything, because He saved us and redeemed us. And so there can be joy, and I see joy in the Scriptures here, 
but the joy for Peter, he's found that, you know what? I assume Peter still enjoyed going fishing. Where's Carl? Like, oh, I bet Peter still like going back home and fishing occasionally. It's pretty cool to catch a walleye two times in a, in a week or so. Um, and so I'm sure he enjoyed fishing, but he realized, he realized as Carl said, it's, it's Jesus and fishing, all right? And life is good. You see it from a different perspective, right? You say, well, who created the walleye? That's a crazy looking fish. Where did that come from? God? Who's the author of life of the fish? God? We could also say Jesus. We see he's the author of life. So, so that's, the, that's the word factor, okay? That's the word factor inside this sermon. I want to just make one insight about the wow factor. Back to the miracle. How did that thing unfold anyway? What all happened with that miracle? Let me just, let me just uh, spotlight a few insights about this, this uh, miracle. Just one of them, really. So the wow factor was this miracle. So let me just uh, get back to a couple thoughts about that. How did that unfold? How did that healing take place, right? Well, it says in our storyline that the, the lame man was laid there, right? He hasn't walked his entire life. He's at the temple. He's begging for money. And then, and then in verse 4, it's like the story kind of shifts when, when Peter and, and John show up and Peter says, Hey, hey, wait, wait, you look at us. Hey, hey, look at us. You know, maybe the guy was probably looking at a variety of people, figuring out who's going to give him money that day. And then Peter catches eyes and says, look at us, right? And so something kind of is going down. You just got to get a sense that something's shifting and changing in the storyline. It says, look at us. And, and then uh, the man's probably expecting, okay, I'm looking. What are you going to give me? Is this going to be a good day? I get more money than I normally get from these guys? And so I don't think the man is expecting anything different than he had always expected, right? Just money coming his way. But Peter's got something different. And, and Peter has, a, I think, just a, a spirit-led moment, uh, like a, a, you know, a divine appointment, a kairos moment, what's called in scriptures. This, I think he's zoning in because the Spirit of God saying, hey, this, this moment, this guy, you've got a word for him, all right? And so Peter, as you know, then says, hey, listen, I don't have any silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And then he says, rise up and walk. And so I, I, I raise the question, you know, what happened here? That's pretty crazy, right? What, what in the world happened? How did that unfold? Well, here's a couple of thoughts of what did not happen. What didn't happen was uh, any kind of witchcraft. I don't think that's what's happening here at all. No kind of magic. No kind of like, you know, uh, sleight of hand somehow. And the guy, he held him up somehow and made it pretend like he's walking into the temple, right? The guy's leaping and praising God. People are gathering. They know something's going down the supernatural. And so it's not witchcraft. It's not magic. It's not sorcery. It's not some kind of psychological thing in the moment to get him to walk that way. The guy's never walked his whole life, right? And so something has gone down. And, and Peter is very clear to point out to, to, not, to not marvel at himself, right? The power uh, of what's taking place here is not of himself, even though he could have done that. I think it's pretty remarkable. Um, yesterday we had a, a men's fellowship. And at this men's fellowship, uh, we were shooting some guns, having some fun with some guns, and we had some skeet shooting going on. And it's my second time skeet shooting, and I had a shotgun. And I got to the line, and it was just me, and Harm was pulling the, the skeet, and, uh, and, then, and then old Andy came around, and Andy wanted to get in on the fun, and so I was thinking, like, oh, man. <laughs> but, just kidding. Word. So, so Andy comes around, and so Andy's down to my right, okay? Skeet's over here. I'm right here with my shotgun. Andy's over here with his shotgun. And, um, and so, so I, I said go, and Harm said, no, that's not the right word. It's pull, right? So... <laughs> Like, that's, I like, that's kind of cool. Pull! You know, it makes it, anyway. So you say pull, right? Pull! And it didn't really matter how I said it or what I said <laughs> because it didn't work for me. Anyway, so you, you say pull and like pow! And then and the thing just keeps flying, you know? And then I, I'd hear a second gunshot. Pow! It splatters, right? Like, Andy got it. Andy shot it, right? So, all right, that's one, all right? Like, pull! Pow! And like, it keeps on going. There goes that skeet, right? Then I hear another second shot, and bam, it splatters, right? It's, it's gone. It disintegrates in the air, like, man. And so third time, same thing. Fourth time, same thing, right? And I'm like, man. Is it? And so I, I start telling Harm, I think it's my gun. You know, it's, it's not me. I tell you. I'm, I'm looking right at it. Like, and, um, but uh, Roy knows it's me. <laughs> it's all me. So, so the fifth one goes up, though. The fifth one goes up, and I go, bam. And it, and it breaks off, right? Not doesn't shatter a whole lot, but it breaks off a little bit. And I'm like, man! And and uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm all excited, right? I, I'm getting all tickled, or whatever. And, and, then, and then it dawned on me, like, wait a minute! I never heard Andy's gun go off. Oh, and and 
and a little bit like, like yeah, he's shot, and then I'm realizing, oh man, he, it's like we shot simultaneously at the same time, right? <laughs> and so, I know in my heart, in my mind, like, I know who probably got it at, at that time. But here's, here's what I was thinking. If, if someone walked up at that moment on number five skeet, right? And they didn't really see, they didn't really focus on Andy. Just kind of, hey, what's Bo doing here? Hey, Bo, you going to go on past the seat. And they, they saw it, and they saw that skeet go up, and that skeet, like, bam, right? Pull, bam. And, like, and like man, Bo, you're a pretty good shot. Like, you dag your mind, I am. Yeah. Was, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm a skeet shooter. Heck yeah. You better believe it, doggone it, you know? And, and, and so, in the moment, right, I could maybe deceive and say, yeah, I'm a pretty good shot, right? I could say, yeah, it's my skill, my marksmanship, I'm a good shooter and all that, and, but I really know it's nothing about me. Actually, Andy's the one who got it. Are you with me? It's really about him. There's, there's someone who has greater marksmanship. There's someone who's a, a better shooter than, than myself, and it's really his skill and, and his abilities, not mine. Church, that's what Peter does. I just want to draw it out some more. Peter, people are drawn to Peter. So Peter, like, like, what are you doing, man? Do you see this guy's never walked before? And, and Peter says, what are you looking at me for? Don't look at me. There's no power in me. There's no piety in me. There's someone who's greater, right? There's someone who's better. There's someone who's more magnificent, right? Much more magnificent. And who is that? And, and Peter points him to whom? Jesus. That's the way the church should always be. It points them to Jesus. The answer is Christ. And so the answer lied in verse 16 that we've already read. I'm going to just read it again because I don't want us to lose sight of this. And his name, name of Jesus, and Jesus' name by faith in his name has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given this man his perfect health in the presence of you all. I don't think this is about the faith of the lame man. I think he's expecting to get money. I think it's talking about the faith of Peter in the moment, saying, listen, my faith, I want you guys to understand, my faith, my hope is not in something I can offer you. My faith and my hope is in Jesus, and he has the power to heal. By the power of the Spirit of God, I've been given this, this season, a special moment, if you will, to, to bring this about, to spotlight Jesus, and so it's all about, it's all about Christ. I don't have any silver or gold, but what I do have, I give you the name of Jesus, rise up and walk for his glory. So the reason I wanted to spotlight this just briefly this morning is this reason. Is that I sense in this storyline that the Apostle Peter, I'm, I'm confident we see it in the Acts story that they, they did some other miracles, the early apostles in various ways. And, and what I've already shown you now, we're only in chapter 3, that the, the miracles always went to a message that always spotlighted the Messiah, and the Messiah is Jesus. I, I think the church today can get that all flipped around. It's like, uh, you come in the name of Jesus, in the covering of Jesus, but you're seeking out miracles that gets all about people and what, what's happening, right? And the extraordinary, if you will. And, and that's not what it's like in the early church. It's, if there's a miracle, it's going to spotlight a message, and the message is going to be about Jesus. It's going to be about Christ. Because why? Because it's hearing the message of Christ and the Word that brings forth an eternal miracle, which is salvation. Are you with me? And that's what takes place here. But here's what I'm thinking about Peter and this lame man. I, I think there was some extra sensitivity to just walking in the Spirit. Um, it's, it's for another day to talk about, wow, what about the miracles today and, and gifts of healing and those kind of things today in the church today? That's not my point this morning to focus on that. I, I believe the apostles over given uh, uh, a Spirit-filled uh, miraculous works, and we see as we walk through Acts that every time those are spotlight Christ to affirm the disciples who are eyewitnesses of the resurrection, that the message is true, and they had to have it verified, and God allowed to be verified by the Holy Spirit working through these men. And so Peter, by the Spirit of God, it wasn't by his own power, it wasn't by his own uh, might and piety, the faith of Jesus, enabled this to take place. And so Peter's just carrying out his role, all right? So, but I think he's also, he's sensitive to the Spirit, how the Spirit's working. I'm, I'm going to assume that Peter walked by some other men that didn't stop and gaze eyes with that morning. I'm not trying to read too much in the Scripture, I'm just saying he probably did, all right? And so one application for us, kind of a side note, as I see the story this morning, is this, is that, is that I don't believe I personally have the gift of healing. Do I believe God can heal? That's a whole different conversation. Hell, heck yeah. Do I pray for healing? Yeah. But I don't have the gift of healing. If I had the gift of healing, anyone here today, I 
God say, come over here, and if I can pray for you, if I, can, if I have the ability to give you healing in the moment, my gosh, I'm going to give that to you if the Lord wills it. But I don't believe I have that gift. But you know what I do have? I have the same message. It has power. And I have the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit within me. And so do you. And so, so you may not have the gift of healing either. I'm going to assume you don't, otherwise you'd be somewhere reaching out to people, bringing that healing to folks. But what you do have is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit dwelling within us should make us sensitive to doing the will of God. And the will of God is to spotlight Jesus. The will of God is to make much of God the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit. And so we can be sensitive to the Spirit's working and how God wants us to connect with people and touch people and reach out to people. And, and then as we pray for people, for healing, for example, we pray like the book says and throughout all the scriptures, if the Lord wills it, He's sovereign over all those things. So, where might God be working this week that you are going to encounter or engage with people where He's saying, hey, see that person? That's the one. You fix your eyes on them. That, that's a person. You need to call that brother or that sister. That's, that's the person that you're to interact with this week. Do you think the Spirit of God can still work that way today? I, th I think He can. I think He can. I was trying to think of a couple of examples uh, to share with you to kind of give you kind of seeing the truth played out. And I thought of one years ago in a hospital setting, and then another one came this morning. I'll share this one instead. Uh, it was actually it was Jim Foster, one of our original elders. Uh, we, had, as a church, bought a van, and we drove that van from from uh, Clarksville uh, to Houston, and, and then uh, on across the I, don't, I can't remember. We got it across the line, or they had to meet us to get across the, the border to get into Mexico to bless some church in their ministry. And uh, as I was thinking about the story and how it relates to this, actually a couple of spirit-led moments came to mind. And so uh, if you, you guys got time, I'll share both Holy Spirit moments. You with me? You got all right, you good? Um, so the one I want to share tied to this is, is at the back end of what I'm going to share. But So we get in the van, though. We're going to drive the van, me and Jim. We're going to drive from here, uh, trying to make it all the way to Dallas without stopping. I don't find, I can't remember how far Dallas is. That's just a long way. Roy, you just went to Texas. It, it, it takes a long time to get out there, and then te you know, Texas is for forever. So, so I said, okay. Well, Jim can't get off work till like uh, eight or nine o'clock in the evening time. And uh, and I said, well, Jim, I said I'll try to get rested up, and I'll drive that first leg, and I should be able to drive through most of the night, and you know, and we'll get somewhere, and, and maybe catch a half hour on the side of the road, and get going. We'll, we'll make it to Dallas, sure, no problem. Well, so Jim and I take off in the evening time. I forget what time we got away, probably maybe 11, 11 o'clock at night, later than we hoped. And so we're in the van, and we're driving to, to Dallas. And we're on the far uh, southwest corner of Virginia. And I hadn't thought about this story in a while, but if you take 58 Highway to the corner of our state, uh, I think it's 58 Highway, you get in some mountain area, right? I forget the mountains you start going through over there. Are you with me? I can't think of the towns now. or uh, But you go up some mountains, and there's some sharp turns. There's some lookout places, you know, if you see it in the daytime, really beautiful and all. And so we get in that part of Virginia, and it's late at night, you know, it's like midnight or one or two in the morning, and uh, as I'm driving, Jim was worn out. He tried to get us all work, worked his tail off to be able to go on the trip, and so he's sleeping. He's dead asleep on the passenger side I'm driving. I said, I got this, Jim. Go to sleep and rest. Well, we get, we get maybe fancy gaps part of that area or something. Anyway, so we're, we're over in that area, and I know we're in the mountainous area, and uh, I'm starting to fight it. You know, just the, just the, the sleep just came over me. You know, I couldn't stay awake. I was fighting to stay awake. Uh, I didn't want to wake up Jim. I wanted to honor Jim. You know, I wanted to get, I wanted to get as far as I could. I didn't want to, hey, Jim, I can't, I can't stay awake. I got to stop. I can't drive anymore. And so, uh, un, you know, not the right decision, but uh, I, you know, I kept driving and rolling down the window, and um, and I, it's, I, it, I had, it was just come over me. You've probably been there before. Well, so that's what's going on, and we're up in that mountain and area. And I've been to the area many times over the years, and I knew there was just dangerous points, right? Look out places you could just go off the road and no, no railing or very little railing. And uh, we're coming around some of those parts of that part of Virginia. And then I'm driving, I'm fighting it, and like, God, will you help me? And I'm slapping my face, you know, like, Lord, Lord. And, and then all of a sudden, I mean, I, I'll never forget it, because it, 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 I, I about jumped out of the van. Jim woke up out of a slumber, and he goes, ah! You know, it's like... And, I mean, it was literally, literally like that. I mean, lost my glasses. See, I mean, it's like, it was crazy. And, and literally, I, he could have caused a wreck just coming out of sleep like that. And, but it's all like, like, what, like, whoa. And, and I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know what was going on, right? And, and I said, are you, are you, you know, I'm wide awake, by the way. 
like, Jim, you, you okay, brother? And he said, yeah. He, he said, he said I, was, I, was, uh, I was having a dream, and he said, where, where are we? He said, I was having a dream, and in my dream, the van was going off the mountain side. Okay, that's... And I, I still want to honor Jim in that moment. And we actually, have, I knew we'd have a conversation later. I said, Jim, I said, everything's good. It's all right. You know, you need some rest. Just going back to sleep. Because I knew I was so wakened in the moment. Trust me, I was awake for hours. I mean, I was like, just like, you know, the, the dream and what happened, it woke me up. And I've never gotten the stories. I look back and I believe that was the Holy Spirit working. I believe the Holy Spirit put that dream in, in, in Jim's mind and, and woke him up that way. And, and I'll ask God when I see him in heaven. I'm not trying to say, well, I know what. I just believe that. But woke him up. It woke me up. It saved us probably going to the mountains. And we made it to Dallas. And eventually we were able to bless the church down in Mexico with that van. And uh, it, was just a, it was just a spirit-led moment. So I, I believe the spirit can, can even in somebody's sleep, for example, Jim, made him sensitive, I guess, to, to somehow be used by God. Well, we go to Mexico, and we, we, we do a mission week in Mexico. Um, we had to fly back home because we didn't, you know, left the van there. And so we get across the border. We're at an airport hotel in Houston, I believe it was. And uh, I think it's like 7 o'clock at night. Uh, Jim had a son living down there. His son got to meet up with him, and uh, it was a nice, a nice evening. It hadn't gotten dark yet. And said, hey, there's a pool somewhere out in the hotel, outdoors. We'll go out to the pool. And so we did that, and, and Jim and his son were talking, so I kind of went over to, I think it had like a, a hot tub area, a smaller pool, maybe a kid pool, and I just thought I'd give them some time to catch up and chat. And um, I remember sitting in a different part of the pool and uh, just reflecting upon the week of being on mission and being, being just uh, all out for Christ. And, and, uh, and I saw a man, there wasn't anybody out there at night, I saw a man come out to come to the pool by himself. And I sent the Spirit of God saying, hey, you know, you need to talk to this guy. And I'm thinking, well, I, I'm kind of worn out. You know, I've been running hard all week long, and usually you think about, yeah, I, well, I don't know the guy. It's going to see, my, you know, you, know, you need to have conversation with this guy, right? So I, oh, okay, we'll see. And sometimes you get, kind of get that sense of, uh, you know, is this the Lord? Is it just me? And so the man comes out, and he's got a whole pool of swimming. Where does he come? <laughs> he comes over to the little hot tub area and, and sit down there, right? Uh, in the summertime, I didn't even get in a hot tub. It's, you know, it's kind of warmer, but you know, it's too hot to get. And so I'm just sitting there, my feet in there, just kind of hanging out, uh, giving Jim and his son space. And so he comes over and sits by me, and it begins a chalk up conversation. It's like, all right, God, you, I, I, you got something going on here, okay? So I have conversation with him, and we begin to talk and to share. And before I, before I know it, he's opening up his, his, his struggles in his life. And I don't even remember what those struggles were. I just remember he had problems, had needs, and began to share those with me. And I began to share why we're there and so forth and, and how God, I believe, uh, is there to help us and He's our answer and hope is in Christ and so forth. And so uh, I, I, shared, I shared Christ with them. I, I, I shared uh, hope in the Lord with them. He didn't respond necessarily to that message like we see some 2,000 men here. But God, by His Spirit, was able to be faithful and realize this is something He wants us to do. And, and I knew that God wanted us to pray for the guy, right? And so I wanted Jim and his son who were still out there to pray as well. And so I said, if you don't mind, I said, I got two brothers over here in Christ, and we'd love to pray for you and just ask God to really intervene and help you in your situation and your needs, if that's okay. And he said, he said that'd be fine. And so I remember, you know, evening time, close to dark, hotel airport in Houston, you know, four guys out there standing next to the pool, uh, and we're praying this guy that we don't know uh, and still would not know unless I see him in heaven someday. Those are the kind of the cool stories, by the way, we're going to get to enjoy in heaven. You're going to meet up with people that you never thought you'd see, and you're going to be able to rejoice together. But anyway, so we're praying for this guy. And um, this is kind of a, it's kind of a simple story, right? It's kind of a, this kind of a, should be a normal thing for believers in Christ. And uh, I, I remember praying for him. I, I've not shared this much. I, I, I shared it with Jim later on that night because it's only probably happened two or three times for me personally. But I'm praying for the guy as I pray. I put my arm on his shoulder. And it's like I literally could feel like uh, almost like a, a physical you know, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not Superman, just a, a, like a power source, like almost like some kind of physical experience going from my body to his as I'm praying for the guy. Just like, like, what is that? I just felt like, like my hand and my, like a tingling and so forth, and I didn't have a pinch in my shoulder like I do today. Uh, but So I was much younger, but I just, I just sensed like, man, like there's something about this prayer time with this fella. And so 
you know, we prayed for him, and that was the end of it. Went back in. I began to share it with Jim later on. I said, you know, Jim, I said, occasionally when I pray, it's like there's just something. It's like, and what I sense, this was interesting, though. What I sense was taking place there is God was just allowing me just to, to know that, hey, I think there's blessing on your end because you were faithful to do what I asked you to do. I want you to pray for the fellow. Uh, there's nothing about you or anything you can offer. Uh, it's about me, but you prayed in my name. You prayed in the name of Jesus, and you blessed this guy. And so you received a blessing as well just to know that I'm with you in the midst of prayer. And, and yeah, it probably looked a little bit peculiar, by the way. Four guys out at a hotel airport in Houston, some business hotel, praying together, right, for this guy you don't know. The church can be peculiar sometimes. But when you listen to the Holy Spirit lead you, and you do what God's Spirit says, and you in the name of Jesus, I believe there's blessings for us in Christ, but then there's also, I believe, blessings for that man. As he walked away so grateful that he didn't pray up. Maybe the first time he's ever been prayed up in his life. Are you with me? I think we can be sensitive to the Spirit of God. You, you, you can't say, well, that, that's a pastoral thing. That, that, that's, a, oh, you're, 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 that's a pastor thing. No, 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 no. I have a certain role that God's given me. Um, you have certain roles that God's given you. We're, I'm just a brother in Christ. If you're in Christ here, we're just brothers and sisters in Christ. And what I'm sharing with you, just what took place with Peter, I'm not an apostle. Peter was an apostle. He had a certain role, special role, yes. But we, we are all, if you're in Christ, I believe... Uh, baptized in the Spirit, filled by the Spirit, and we can all be sensitive to the Spirit of God leading us to make much of Jesus. And so I want to encourage us to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit this week. Is there going to be somebody who says, hey, he may, not, he, not, he may not say, hey, look at me. He just may be telling you, that person there, that's who you need to have a conversation with this day. You need to encourage that brother. You need to pray for that sister. You need to, you need to reach out to that employee or call that family member, whatever it is, is the Spirit of God speaking? I believe the Spirit of God is alive, obviously, and He's working in His church. And when He works in His church, you will be blessed, and the people we encounter will be blessed as well. Sure, yeah, there'll be some persecution on the backside. We'll see that next week, or week after next. But it's worth it in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to gather and to to see this, the cool stories of your working out your glory uh, in the early church. Thank you for uh, this lame man who was healed and uh, given given uh, physical life, Lord. I, I pray and trust that, man, I pray that he also came to Christ and was one of the 2,000 that was numbered to receive that eternal healing. Lord, I pray that here today as well. There may be someone who has physical needs. I pray for their healing in Jesus' name. But Lord, also, more importantly, if there's someone here that has spiritual needs, that spiritually, if they were needing need to come into Christ, that you would draw them to accept Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord, if they're walking with Jesus, but they're walking astray and drifting away, Lord, by your Spirit, will you draw them to repent of sin and trust their faith in you? Lord, that we can walk in the Spirit and be sensitive to the Spirit of God at work within us to be on mission for the kingdom of God. God, build your church, and we'll be faithful, we pray, to give you all the glory and all the praise. In Christ's name, and God's people said... Amen, amen. God bless you all this week as you listen to the Holy Spirit and live for Jesus.